Welcome to part two of colligative properties. In the first part, we looked at freezing point depression and boiling point elevation as two examples of colligative properties. Colligative properties being properties that depend only on the amount of solute dissolved and not the type of solute. We're now going to look at a third colligative property, and that colligative property is vapor pressure. Now, vapor pressure is something we've talked about before. We know that vapor pressure exists because molecules at the surface of a liquid are able to escape the liquid and exist in the vapor phase right above it. And that vapor has a pressure that it exerts. We call that vapor pressure. Now, as you add solute to a solvent, we see that the vapor pressure of the solvent, the liquid, drops. So as you add solute, the vapor pressure goes down. This lowering of vapor pressure is a colligative property. Now there is a caveat to this. The solute that's added has to be a non-volatile solute. Non-volatile means that the solute shouldn't have its own vapor pressure. Okay? It's something that does not have a measurable or significant vapor pressure. If we think about this from a molecular standpoint, this should make sense as to why adding a solute would lower the vapor pressure of the substance. The vapor pressure of a substance is determined by the amount of molecules of that substance that can enter the vapor phase and exist above the liquid. If I go and dissolve particles into that solvent, I have non-volatile dissolved particles in that solvent, I've decreased the relative amount of solvent available to enter the vapor phase. I haven't changed the actual amount of solvent, but by going from 100% solvent molecules to maybe 96%, for example, or 95 or 94, this lowering of solvent concentration means that there are relatively less molecules of the solvent able to enter the vapor phase and generate vapor pressure. So adding a solute that's non-volatile lowers the overall vapor pressure. This lowering of vapor pressure actually explains the boiling point elevation that we discussed in the last video. Boiling point elevation occurs because for a substance to boil, its vapor pressure has to equal atmospheric pressure. But if the colligative property says that as we dissolve things, the vapor pressure is going down, it requires even higher temperatures to push that vapor pressure up to match atmospheric pressure. That's why the substance has now a higher boiling point. It's because the vapor pressure has been lowered. Now that we've looked at three different colligative properties, we're gonna see how we can calculate the degree to which these properties change based on the concentration of solute added. And to do that, we're going to use molality. So molality is useful because it relates moles of solute to kilograms of solvent. And we can use molality to predict both the boiling point elevation and the freezing point depression with two very similar equations. For boiling point elevation, we get the equation delta Tb equals Kb with this lowercase m for molality. The equation for freezing point depression is going to look very similar, and we have delta Tf equals Kf, and again the lowercase m for molality. So we've already said that these two variables here, the m's, those are both molality. These terms at the start, delta Tb and delta Tf, refer to the change in the boiling point temperature for Tb, B for boiling, or the change in the freezing point temperature, F for freezing. So the last thing we need to know is what this Kb and Kf terms refer to. And these are constants. Kb is called the molal boiling point elevation constant, because it's for boiling point elevation. And as you can imagine, Kf is the molal freezing point depression constant. Now it's important to note that both of these constants change depending on the substance. So the constants Kb and Kf are unique for each substance. Here's a table that shows the molal constants Kb and Kf for water and vinegar. As you can see, the values are different for Kb and Kf for both boiling point elevation and freezing point depression for each substance. The last thing we're going to point out is that the units for these constants are always degrees Celsius per molal, lowercase m. So now how can we use these equations? Well, let's look at an example that we can walk through using these constants and these equations to see if we can figure out how much a dissolved solute will change 
the freezing point temperature, or boiling point temperature. Here's our example. At what temperature will water freeze if 100 grams of sodium chloride are dissolved in 500 grams of water? So the question is asking what temperature water will freeze at. Okay, we're looking for the freezing temperature. And we know water normally freezes at zero degrees Celsius. But I also know that I'm dissolving something and that freezing point depression is a colligative property. So freezing point depression occurs when something's dissolved. So I'm gonna use my equation, delta Tf, for the change in freezing point temperature equals Kf times the molality. Let's see if I can start figuring some of this stuff out. Well, I know Kf, because Kf is just from this table. Again, here's a table with water and vinegar. I want the Kf for water, so that's gonna be 1.86 degrees Celsius per molal. And now I need to know the molality to continue with this equation because I'm looking for this part. I'm looking for the change in freezing point temperature. So I know the definition of molality. I know that it's moles of solute divided by kilogram of solvent. Unfortunately, this scenario doesn't tell me anything about moles. All I know is that I have 100 grams of NaCl. I need to change that into moles. So 100 grams of NaCl, I can use dimensional analysis to figure this out. So times one mole of NaCl over the molecular mass of NaCl, which is 58 grams, is going to give me the moles of NaCl that 100 grams is equal to. And if I solve this, I'm going to see that I have 1.72 moles of NaCl. So that's really helpful that I have moles now. I can now plug that in over here. 1.72 moles over kilograms of solvent. Well, I have 500 grams, so that's half of a kilogram. So I have 0.5 kilograms of water as my solvent. Solving this expression tells me that I have a 3.44 molal solution of sodium chloride. But there is one more thing I need to be careful of. I know that in water, NaCl dissociates completely into Na plus and Cl minus. So it's not actually 3.44 molal. I need to account for the fact that every molecule of NaCl makes two actual particles. So for the sake of this equation, I'm going to treat this 3.44 as if it was multiplied by 2 because I have two particles. So now I can start plugging in some of this stuff. I have delta Tf, my change in freezing point temperature, equals Kf, which I said was 1.86. I'm going to multiply that by the molality, or the effective molality that I have, which is 6.88. This is the 3.44 times 2 molality. And by multiplying these together, I'm going to see how much my freezing temperature changes by. It turns out that that's 12.8 degrees Celsius. Now, we have to use some common sense here. We know that the freezing point was originally zero and that the property is that freezing point is lowered. So the change is 12.8, but I need to go 12.8 degrees below zero. So it's really zero minus 12.8 degrees Celsius, meaning the new freezing temperature, the new freezing point of the water is negative 12.8 degrees Celsius. A solution made by dissolving 100 grams of sodium chloride into 500 grams of water would require a temperature of negative 12.8 degrees Celsius to freeze. So there's a couple things you need to be aware of when looking at colligative properties from a numerical standpoint or a quantitative standpoint. First is that if you're given grams, you need to get to moles. They okay, follow the equation. The equation tells you you need moles and kilograms. So if you're given grams, use your dimensional analysis to find out the number of moles. The second thing to be aware of, and this is really important, is that if you have an ionic compound, that's your solute, that you take into account for any dissociation that occurs. So for NaCl, it dissociated into two particles, and we took that into account with the effective molality. If it were something like calcium chloride, this would become three particles, so we'd want to treat it as times three for the molality. Whereas something like sugar would not dissociate at all, 
And so we wouldn't want to change the calculated molality at all. That wraps up our lesson on colligative properties. Write down any questions you have in your notes and bring them with you to class.